Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, moni muli wanji, namaste, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so very honored that you would join us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, wherever you find your podcast. And please let your family and friends know all about us. We have two amazing guests joining us today, the author and illustrator of the adorable series, Bob Shea and Brian Wan. Before we invite Bob and Brian into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by What Can I Be? STEM Careers from A to Z, written by Tiffany Tichy. This is an inspiring and easy-to-read alphabet picture book that teaches our next generation all about science, technology, engineering, and math careers. This book provides colorful illustrations of six diverse children representing various STEM careers, astronauts, doctors, scientists, engineers, helping kids ages five to eight see themselves in one of these STEM careers and motivates them to shape their future through STEM. Tiffany Tichy is a senior mechanical engineer, STEM advocate, professional speaker, and international best-selling author of the children's book, What Can I Be? STEM Careers from A to Z. What a great book for your family library. Get it today. What Can I Be? STEM Careers from A to Z by Tiffany Tichy. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by Little Littley by Haley Nystrom and her daughter, Susan Nystrom. We really love this book. Little Littley is the little dog with the big bark and the bigger heart. All his life, Littley has wandered the streets of his little town looking for a friend. When a thunderstorm sends Littley running into the home of another lonely soul, they find the companionship they've both been longing for. With vibrant and folksy illustrations, Little Littley by mother-daughter team Susan and Haley Nystrom is a heartwarming story of love, acceptance, and the beauty of found family. You're going to want to find this book, A Place on Your Family Library. It's Little Littley by Susan and Haley Nystrom. Boy, I think this is going to be a fun conversation. Our guests are coming to us from both Los Angeles and the New Haven area of Connecticut. They are the illustrator and author of the adorable series. Please welcome to the show the, Ill- the author, Bob Shea, and the illustrator, Brian Wan. Brian, Bob, how are you? Good. How doing are you, great. Jay? Thanks. Yeah, doing very well. Um, I, I always do this on the podcast. I introduce two guests, and the people hear these two voices, and they have no idea which one is which, especially when <laughs> they're both guys. Um Bob, you're down in Connecticut. Um, can you tell us what the Adorable series is all about? Sure. Adorable is uh, uh, the simplest way. Is it's it's puppies and trucks. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, the best way to get to get your head around it is just puppies and trucks. And so these are are the puppies are like little toddlers, and they go to to uh, preschool to learn how to drive big construction vehicles. But they don't know how to use them because they behave like toddlers and they have the, you know, cognitive abilities of toddlers. <laughs> so they live the toddler dream by getting to drive these big trucks, but they don't, but they lack object permanence and all those kind of things. So it makes it fun. That sounds like fun. And, and you're right. Little kids love big trucks. We just had a, uh, one of those touch a truck um, events in our neighborhood here in Reedville, and it was packed. There were th- hundreds and hundreds of families. They love them. Yeah, they really do. Brian, what was it like illustrating um, those big trucks and puppies and all that fun stuff? Yeah, it, 
You know what, Jed? It was terrifying because Bob is being humble right now, but he's an amazing illustrator in his own right. And so when he came to me and asked me to, you know, work on this project together, I was like, oh, my gosh. The whole time I was drawing, I was like, Bob could be doing this so much better. But uh, certainly it was a lot of fun drawing trucks. I've got a, a, my son who's now 12, but when he was a toddler, loved garbage trucks. I'd go to those uh, garbage truck, uh, you know, open houses honk the horns, like all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, it, it, was a, it was a great thrill. I really loved it. So much fun. I, you know, I can relate to your son. Even now, I, as I'm approaching 100 years of age, I just <laughs> – I love when, when I see one of the neighbors throw out a couch or there's something big and it's garbage day and I just – trying to make sure I'm around when it's going in the back of the thing and the thing comes down and crushes it and breaks it all up and everything. Oh, yeah. It's, That's it's, awesome. <laughs> they have a, in my, in my neighborhood, it's got, the truck's got this big claw and the claw grabs the garbage bin mm-hmm. and lifts it up and dumps it and puts it down. I <laughs> try to watch it every time they come by. Let and me I, ask you, Bob, are they really accurate or do you see just trash flying out as the cluster? I don't, you know, <laughs> no, well, when they dump it, it's into the big open top of the garbage thing. But I'm always like, how do they get it with the claw? Like, how do yeah. they stop the truck so that the claw can get it? Mm-hmm. I still don't. I think there's got to be some kind of camera system or something. But <laughs> Sounds like an idea for the next book. I was going to say, with, <laughs> stick a puppy in a garbage truck, Brian. With a claw. With a claw. With a claw, with a video screen that you have to look at while you're also driving this big, however many ton truck down the street. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> I, I wonder if they're hiring. <laughs> <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, we just proved in the first three minutes of this episode that uh, boys don't grow up. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> Bob, where did the inspiration for this book come from? I think, you know, I think that I had the, um, I said the word adorable incorrectly mm-hmm. one time. I don't know why. I mispronounced it for some reason, and I said adorable, and uh I was like, that's so fun how that word kind of works that way. And I, and then I would thought that would be cute if little puppies rode around in construction vehicles. <laughs> and then, and then from there, it, it just sort of, it bloomed. And I, I, I was going to draw it myself first. Like Brian said, I'm an illustrator, but I am, t- am enough of an illustrator to know when I'm inappropriate for something. So uh, I, I got a hold of Brian and I ran the idea by him and I was thrilled to be able to work with him. Now you're mentioning that you reached out to, to Brian um, and, and you're t- traditionally published by a, you know, b- a big publishing house. Most authors don't have that luxury of reaching out and picking their own illustrators. Yeah. You know, it's, it's <laughs> round upon. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. They weren't like, yeah, Bob, just go get somebody. We trust you. <laughs> like, so, you know, it was no sure thing. When I talked to Brian, I was like, hey, listen, I don't know what's going to happen with this. If anything, if you're in, we can try it. And I've had a lot of luck with that. I, my Brian's background is art direction. My background is art direction. So we both, I, I, I wasn't just picking him because Brian's nice. He's my friend. You know, <laughs> I was familiar with his work. It's gr- It's his work's beautiful and very graphic, but warm at the same time. It was all the things I was trying, I was failing at achieving. So it was a no brainer for me. And then when we presented the whole package, nobody even, nobody blinked. They were like, yeah, Brian's perfect. Yeah. So it, was, it worked out, but I know what you're saying about that. Yeah. I, should add, I should add though, I was ready for Bob to find someone better, stronger, more <laughs> handsome than myself. If he wanted, you know, uh, if the publishers had, Loved the manuscript, but didn't like the illustrations. I totally was fine with Bob finding someone else to work with. Well, I, you know, you know, it's uh, it must have been good to to know that uh, Bob thought that you were an appropriate illustrator. I, I've never I've never heard a children's illustrator refer to themselves as inappropriate for a project. But uh, <laughs> we're, we're learning things all the time here in the on the podcast. I mean, that, that confidence certainly helped as I was working on it because I have a lot of self-doubt and uh, have a lot of um, imposter syndrome as I'm working. But knowing that Bob had faith in me certainly helped carry me as I was going through making the artwork. Um, I mean, our family's always been a huge fan of Bob Shea's books. Like my kid loved I'm a Shark when he was a toddler, and 
I don't know. It was just super, such a fun idea to connect with this manuscript. And who doesn't love puppies? I love puppies. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I hope you do too, Jed. <laughs> uh, especially puppies driving big, huge trucks. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Brian, how did you and Bob first uh, connect with each other? That's a really good question. I mean, Bob, okay, here's here's the truth. is I was starting off in kids publishing, and Bob was one of – one of very few already established author illustrators that reached out to me and made me feel very welcome to join the publishing community, I guess, kids book community. And so it meant the world to me, like, oh, wow, Bob Shea is reaching out to me. I mean, there's a couple of artists, also like Scott Magoon was the same way, too. He was just such a, just really welcoming and made me feel like I belonged. Um, so that was our first interaction. I think it might have been on Instagram, Bob. I'm not really sure if it, or yeah. by email or something. Um, and then... Bob was doing a book reading at the L.A. Book Festival, and he said, hey, Brian, let's grab some dinner. And so we had a chance to actually meet up. This was a, a while back. How many years ago, Bob? must have been. Oh, my gosh. That, yeah, that was – I can't even remember what book I was reading at the festival. That was a long time ago. Yeah, it might have been. I, for sure more than six years ago, I think. Yeah. And we, we had dinner, and we went to Daiso, which is this 99-cent uh, Japanese stationery store. So had good. Blast. Yeah. <laughs> And then we bonded over that we both have Honda CRVs, and we both have <laughs> one only. We both have only children, and uh, yes, there's a lot of similarities and, there. So. Imposter syndrome and anxiety. We both oh, yeah. have that. Yeah. that. That was good to commiserate over. <laughs> well, you know, you've you've both used that that word imposter syndrome, um, Bob. That and, and that's a new term. I didn't kind of grow up with that. I I just had you know people older than me saying, "Shut up and do the work." <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? But can you can you talk a, a little bit about that and and how you kind of uh, deal with it and are able to go out and create create great books and great illustrations despite the fact that you oftentimes think that you're imposter and you don't belong. Uh, that's a really good question. I I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, and I've met a lot of artists and creatives who have the same uh, problem. You know, we sit we sit in a room by ourselves. We're generating these ideas ourselves. We have to put all this stuff out there. And no one is telling you that you have no boss or anything who's like, yeah, that's okay. Keep going. You're good. <laughs> right? So you're sitting here and you're like, everything I do is terrible. You have those days. So eventually, I think just because I'm old, like, I got to the point where I was like, okay, fine. You're terrible. You are the worst there is, and you shouldn't be doing this. It still has to get done. Mm. Keep doing it. And I would, I was like, you know, go, go on anyway. What are you going to do? You're going to quit because you don't think that you can do it. Just do it and let they'll, when they stop asking you to do it, that's when you stop. Mm -hmm. So I just was like, the work still has to get done. Just, just do the work and, and, push those ideas out of your head and just, I just didn't ran out of time for them. I couldn't give them any more energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about you, Brian? Have you found a strategy to kind of get, get the work done? Yeah, I, I think, well, in terms of getting the work done, it's a lot of shame and, uh, <laughs> you know, I come from a shame based culture. Jet, so it's like, I've got to get this done or Bob's going to think my family sucks, like all this kind of stuff. But, uh, in terms of dealing with imposter syndrome, I think when I was a much younger artist, um, now I'm, I'm 44, but uh, when I was a younger artist, I kept a lot of that bottled up. And so it felt like my kind of dirty secret that I felt like oh, everyone's going to know that I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but as I've gotten older, I realize the more I share, the more open I am about it and I share it openly, then I can have these conversations with people like Bob. Mm -hmm. Or with Scott, or any you know, just people who are more established, and it's reassuring to know, oh, they're going through the same exact problem as I am. Like, oh, they're dealing with the same things, and it becomes less of a hidden secret. But you realize it's like kind of one of millions of thoughts that your brain has you know, multiple times a day. I remember my wife telling me, like, uh, all your thoughts aren't true, and that to me was really kind of a huge light bulb moment for me because I'm like, you're right. I think so many dumb things a day. I'm like, that sky is too blue. That tree is just too fresh. Like, that kind of stuff. And I'm like, oh, then the idea that I don't belong or that I'm a horrible artist, is what, it, it's part of those dumb thoughts, too. So. Yeah. yeah. Thoughts are just thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. That, that could be a great title for the episode. I think a lot of dumb things during the day. 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm all in. You can definitely put my name under that. Don't worry about it. You know, I I had a similar experience. Um, being a, a magic was never something that I I loved as a kid. Most magicians start doing magic when they're ten and twelve years old, and I didn't. I I was a social worker, and then got into performing and. Someone said, you should do some magic and taught me a trick, and and I did. And I only learned enough to kind of tell stories with. Um, Mm -hmm. And that was good enough for me, and it was was a great vehicle. But uh, I was performing at a school in Pennsylvania one day, and uh, uh, my host said, oh, my my husband's a magician. Can he come and see the show? And I said, yeah, sure. And after the show, after the kids all left – the the husband came up to me and he shook my hand and he said, you are a perfect example that proves that you don't have to be a great magician to be a great performer. <laughs> <laughs> and all the people who Thank heard you. him were hired. They, they were horrified that he said that. I knew exactly what he was saying. He like I I had enough skill to get through and do what I wanted to do on stage. Um, and there were so many magicians. There's so many 10-year-old magicians who were better than me. <laughs> but uh, so working for Bob Bryant, have you – has, you know, being – having this project be a success, has it helped your confidence a, a bit and, you know, lessen that imposter feeling? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I think what it is is that imposter feeling will always be there. I don't think it's like less or it'll – it certainly increases when someone says something awful to me. But uh, I don't know if it will ever lessen, and I have to accept that, mm-hmm. I, I think. But, you know, having Bob as a friend and obviously having this book published too is an amazing experience. It's always – uh, I don't know. It's always such a, a small needle – a, a thread to get through in this needle hole to get a book published in my mind, you know? Yeah, and so yeah. it, it, what a treat to be working with a friend on it together. Um, but yeah, I, I think just working with Bob, having these conversations about imposter syndrome, and then also talking about our, how cool our CRVs are, th- all that stuff really helps. <laughs> yeah, it makes the days really fun. I, I think the imposter syndrome is just like a comfortable sweater. It's just always, you know, yeah. you're like, yeah, this is where I belong within this self doubt. And you just, you just ignore it after a while. You're like, yep, there you are. There I you see are. you. Yeah. I got work to do. <laughs> Bob, Bob, as I'm listening to you and speaking to you, you know, this is the first time we've chatted, but just in this short time that, we're, that we've been speaking together, you remind me a lot of one of my favorite comedians, Bill Burr, a Bostonian. And it, I just get the sense that you have a very sharp wit, maybe a bit sarcastic and – you know, you're not Mr. Rogers, uh, and and I mean that as a compliment. Um, do, do you think you bring some of that wit into your work? Well, you know, I I definitely try to write things that uh, keep me entertained. Okay, I don't mean that in a selfish way, but I don't I don't adopt a new persona. Like things that are funny to me in my books are things that are funny to me in real life, and they're mostly very dry and. You know, very a little more absurd kind of thing. So mm-hmm. I try to I I appreciate you saying that, and I try to bring all that stuff to my books. Definitely, yeah. I yeah. want parents to enjoy them. You know, parents at the end of the day, they're reading this book with their kids. They want to be like they they don't want to watch their kids digging through the book pile on the floor and go, please don't pick that one. Please don't pick. <laughs> oh, he did that one again. I got it. I can't skip pages. A little no. I want them to be like, oh yeah, we'll read this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it'll be fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There was a book when my kids were younger. It was a Dr. Seuss book and it was Fox and Socks. And I have a speech impediment and F is one of those those letters that gets me. And I'd come home from a long drive back from from Connecticut or New Jersey and they'd pull that book out, I think intentionally because they knew I was going oh. to stutter my way through it. That's a That is a tough one that I I don't think we ever had that in the house, but I remember seeing that and being like. What a just a sadist, Doctor Seuss. <laughs> you can use that as the title of the show. <laughs> we will, and it will. We'll put out alternate versions of this show, <laughs> right? But really, like, oh, who? You know, I'm like, clearly, mm-hmm. the men. Mm-hmm. When I know they did, he never had children. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say that, Bob. We as 
when whenever Charlie would, um, who's my son, would pull out your books, it was always such a blast. Like we knew it was oh, going to be a good book to read. And he, Bob's got this really special gift, Jed, of like he knows how to speak in a non-condescending way to children, mm-hmm. and it really engages them in the in the language too. It, it's just this really magical thing. Like there's this That's book fine. that. Bob, you wrote, I know you love compliments, so I'm going to keep going. Oh, how wonderful oh, you are. I'm getting smaller and smaller over here. <laughs> there was I'm a shark, and there's a whole bit about being scared of spiders. And I remember my son at night would just keep repeating those lines over and over again about a creepy, crawly <laughs> spider. And so, right. yeah. Thank yeah. you, Bob, for gifting us that. <laughs> Thank you for remembering. Well, you know, <laughs> Brian – I, I understand completely what, what you're talking about because um, what, when my kids were younger, I hated the children's music that or the music that was marketed as children's music, you know, and because it was condescending. I don't know if condescending is a word, but it just wasn't. It didn't seem sincere to me. The um, saccharine. Yeah, yeah, that's the word. And, you know um, – I, I was much more, you know, interested in t- introducing them to, you know, music that I liked, that they were going to like listen to for the rest of their lives. And the same with, with stories and um, um, the cartoons that we watched together and the books that that we read together. Um, I think there is a way to acknowledge that kids are little people, and they're and they're people, and they deserve to be respected. Yeah, no, that's a great point about the music. There's a child, anything children's related. There's a zaniness to it that mm-hmm. almost feels really forced, and mm-hmm. that's what's mm-hmm. hard for me. Like too many trumpets. I don't know what it is, but like <laughs> trombones. Uh, but I totally get where you're coming from. There's also this part of children that's really fascinating as they're becoming tastemakers or what they like to see. They're so there's no reference point for them. It's not like they've talked to their friends and like, oh that second Star Wars movie is the best of the three, right? They're coming to with their own conclusions. So mm-hmm. there's something really pure about when they love something. And mm-hmm. like, a, you know, board books, children's books are a mm-hmm. great example of this. They love it so much that they want to read it over and over again. And it's, I don't know, there's never going to be a time again where there's no reference point for anything. Like mm-hmm. when they become 16, it's going to be influenced by their peers or what they've seen on YouTube, that kind of stuff. But Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. It, it, it's it is they just have a visceral reaction to it and just love it unconditionally and can't even explain why. Like I know your son was a big Thomas the Tank Engine fan as well, oh, right? Huge, Brian? Yeah, huge, yeah. I still have bins of those t- trains in my my son's eighteen, and I still have bins of those trains in my basement. Yeah, <laughs> that was a big thing in my house too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love that I'm able to have these con- a conversation with two guys who love being dads and love spending time with kids. Yeah, I love being a dad, but I don't think that also equates to me being a good dad. Like, I lose my temper. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, go, I go to bed every night thinking, ah, I failed today as a father. I, but, uh, <laughs> I, I definitely have selfish, moody dad days where, where I'm like, man, I didn't handle that one so well. Yeah. Maybe he'll forget. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I do think, you know, it is, it is wonderful. I mean, my, my wife's always like, don't smile at, at random kids because they're going to think you're weird, you know? So I'm like, okay, I got to tone it down too. But uh, I, I do that too, though. Isn't it terrible how that's wrong? Like how that's bad. You're like, Hey, look, little kids are having fun and you smile at them and you're like, yeah, you shouldn't do that. I'm like, why? I'm not, I'm just, you know, I don't know. I mean, I guess it makes sense, but. Yeah. I mean, there's a part that reminds me of when my son was much younger, and it, it you know, elicits a smile, right? Like, mm-hmm. I remember when my kid was yeah, that little. Yeah, well, that's the thing, right? You yeah. see you see dads doing stuff with their parents, doing stuff with their kids, and you're like, oh, yeah, we, you know, we, especially when they're younger, you're like, yeah, we used to do that, and then I was really tired. <laughs> that's true. It's so true. <laughs> well, this is a, this is a blast. Um, I'm, I'm curious, Brian. Bob is an illustrator and author. Are, have you tried your hand at, at writing? I have. And whenever I read Bob's manuscripts or other people's manuscripts, I'm like, oh, this is how you're supposed to do it. But uh, my first my first debut book was one that I authored. Um, actually, it was a 
first three books were uh, written. I, I, I wrote the, the manuscript for it. Um, you know why I'm kind of having a hard time talking about this? is The realization that I'm not the best writer, even my emails, like I'll have to ask my wife to double check them just because of my anxiety. Like, does this sound weird? Is my grammar correct here? Did I use this idiom correctly? Um, but so that's, that's where the sort of insecurities about writing come from. But I really enjoy it. It's, it's a difficult task though. It's like, um, it's like whittling a uh, golf pencil from a sequoia tree. It's like, you've got this massive big thing, but for children, but you just got to keep cutting it down, cutting it, shaving it down. Especially I think nowadays word counts are going down for manuscripts too. But, uh, mm-hmm. but just getting to that base core idea that, that you don't want to be too wordy, and you want to also give a moment for the illustrations to shine. It's it's a delicate process that I'm not as confident as I am in, in um, illustrating. Mm-hmm. But, uh, what was Hooray for Hat the first one? That was the first one, yes. It's gorgeous. It's just this gorgeous book. And the thing is, when you make these books, as when you're doing all playing all the roles, because you did the typography in that too, right, Brian? Yeah, I mean, there's an art director as well, but uh, yeah, so but I mean, takes that, a village. Yeah, that, <laughs> he's being he's being modest. That's why I knew about him. He had this just this gorgeous style, and there's all these moving parts, and you have to think about the story, and you have to think about how the illustrations help the story and how they work together because they're not just they're not both doing the same thing. And then what the typography does and the layout, and there's just so many pieces of one book that you don't that. Just picking one up and reading it, you wouldn't think about. Mm-hmm. And Brian knocked it out of the park. Yeah, it's, one of, it's interesting that you notice the typography because I remember I really wanted to make the kerning on the word hooray really wide because mm-hmm. I wanted the kids to just know notice each letter, and each letter was colored differently too. Mm-hmm. Um, so thank you for noticing, Bob. Oh, it's gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm excited. Um, what's next for you, Bob? Uh, book wise, book wise, illustration wise, uh, illustration going wise. dancing wise. I had a book. I'm not. A, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to talk about it. Ooh, okay. I guess I am. Okay. I'm gonna. T- I'm gonna. We won't tell. Leave, anybody. Make it. Make it mysterious. So that I'm gonna throw be... my career under the bus. Here, I'm gonna talk about. No, I. I have. I have a few things that I'm excited about that are coming up, and I'm really happy about them. But I. I don't know if I should talk about it. Okay. All right. All right. I'm sorry. That's okay. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. <laughs> Brian, do you have anything that you're able to talk about? Yeah. You know, my big thing is I'm going to cook a brisket for the first time this Friday. I'm going to smoke it. Are you going to smoke it? I'm going to smoke it. I'm going to try to make it like a 15 hour cook, maybe longer. We'll mm-hmm. see how long. But, uh, mm-hmm. I know. I'm kidding, Jed. I know you're like, I don't care about your brisket. Uh, but the brisket's fine. That's- <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm excited. Up, you might, that's that's ambitious. You might want to start with a pork shoulder. It's harder to mess up. You know, I, I've done tri-tip and some ribs, and so I'm like, I'm, I think I'm ready for the brisket. Okay, good. Yeah, I wasn't we'll questioning see. your abilities. Oh no, no, no. I'm, I'm questioning my abilities, Bob. <laughs> so, but uh, in terms of books, I don't have anything lined up next. I do have some kernels of ideas of stories I want to tell. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, summertime is always tough because my my kids um, home from school, and so like, you know. The weather's nice. I want to hang out with him. Yeah. But it's, yeah. it's nicer during the winter to write books, I feel like. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> or when it's raining outside. Well, we've had a great time speaking to the author and illustrator of the Adorable series, Bob Shea and Brian Wan. Hey, Brian. Hey, Bob. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. That was great. Thanks. Yeah, that was thanks, fun, fun conversation. I'm realizing I ended the last story I told was about a brisket. Oh my gosh! I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna be so mad at myself that later. Great. Today. <laughs> we got a we have a third potential title. I'm ready for brisket. <laughs> hey, I forgot I forgot to ask you guys to tell us where we can go to find out more. So Bob, tell us where we can go to find out more about you. BobShea.com or Instagram is uh, at BobSheaBooks. And Brian. Yeah, BrianWan.com, so be, Brian with an I, and Wan, W-O-N, so B-R-I-A-N-W-O-N.com, and then my Instagram handle is B-W-O-N, and number one. Awesome. Brian Wan, Bob Shea, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Jed. Yeah, Have thanks, Jed. That was great. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. We'll be speaking with Olabimi Sola, Rude Perkovitz, and Donna Limerick. Talking about May Makes a Way. Great, great story. 
Bimmy has been on the show before. She is here with Donna Limerick. Donna is the daughter of Mae Reeves, who uh, her story is just amazing. You don't want to miss it. That's the next episode of the Read With Your Kids podcast. We would love for you to connect with us on social media, facebook.com slash reading with your kids, at reading with your kids on Instagram, at reading with your kids on TikTok, and at Jedly Magic on Twitter. And please be sure to go to our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Click on the contact button at the top of the page to let us know what we're doing right. Let us know what we could be doing better. And let us know who you would like to hear on a future episode of the podcast. And of course, we'd love for you to sign up for our free newsletter. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, we want to start by thanking our guest, Bob Shea, Brian Wan. Please be sure to check out the Adorable series. What a great, fun time we have had today. Also, want to thank our sponsor, Little Littley by Susan and Haley Nystrom. And of course, What Can I Be? STEM Careers from A to Z by Tiffany Tichy. I think my team deserves a nice big thank you. Fana McCann, Rory Grady, Nicole Bell Castro, Ashley Contouris, Mirabella Q, Rain Pan. Of course, my beautiful wife deserves a huge thank you for all the support she gives me. I think Augie the Doggy deserves a thank you. He's keeping me here safe in the studio. And of course, you, you deserve the biggest thank you of all. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast.